All right, it's noon. So good afternoon and welcome students, faculty, and members of the community. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. This is the third part of the 2020 Integrated Health Seminar Series that's provided by the Marcus Institute of Integrative Health here at FAU Medicine. My name is Anton Borgia, and I'm the director of the newly established Marcus Institute of Integrative Health at FAU Medicine. And I'm excited to be one of your speakers today, together with Dr. Joanna Drolos. Uh, we at FAU have had the privilege of our previous speakers uh, coming down from the Marcus Institute of Integrative Health at Jefferson University in Philadelphia. Dr. Dan Monti and Dr. George Zabrecki both provided engaging seminars on the respective areas of specialty in integrative medicine. And what we hope to accomplish today is to look at the broader practice and philosophy of integrative medicine and how this can be used to provide a more proactive, prevention focused, and whole person approach to healthcare. But before we begin, just a few housekeeping items since this is the first time we are providing this seminar virtually. Everyone who has logged in has been automatically muted. Um, and, and as you probably notice, you're not going to be able to use your camera either. We are reserving about 15 minutes at the end of the presentation for questions and answers. And so for a Q&A session, so any, any questions you may have, you can send it through the chat function. The seminar is also being recorded. So for students who would like to review the presentation in the future, this will be made available. We appreciate your patience as well ahead of time in case we run into some technical problems. So finger cross, fingers crossed that everything goes smoothly. Uh, to begin, I wanted to share a little bit about my background and then Dr. Drolos, Drolos will also introduce herself and then we will get started. I have been practicing integrated medicine for the past 20 years. I started in the field working as a yoga therapist and as a chiropractic assistant. I then received my degree in traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture from Yosan University and practices Southern California, in Southern California, which is where I'm from. I then made the decision to go back to medical school with a vision to ultimately be a bridge between non-conventional medicine and conventional medicine. What I like to believe is the bridge between Eastern and Western medicine. I graduated from A.T. Still University School of Osteopathic Medicine in Arizona, uh, completed an internship at the Center for Family and Community Medicine at Columbia University in New York Presbyterian, and then completed my family medicine residency at Quillen College of Medicine at East Tennessee State University. I'm board certified in family medicine, and prior to joining FAU, I was a faculty at the Ohio State University College of Medicine, as well as the division director for integrated medicine and the medical director for integrative oncology at the OSU James uh, Comprehensive Cancer Center. My clinical practice incorporates the tools and training that I received. So I use acupuncture, osteopathic manipulation, botanical medicine, nutrition, mind-body practices by getting my patients. And my main areas of focus include integrative medicine consultations for all ages, integrative oncology, and non-pharmaceutical treatments for pain. So my co-presenter, Joanna, Dr. Joanna Drogos, will now introduce herself. Thanks so much, Dr. Borgia. I'm really grateful to be included as a part of this presentation and part of the clinical team that will deliver integrative healthcare in our new practice. I consciously chose to pursue osteopathic training for medical school because of the osteopathic philosophy, which I'll share with you shortly. I earned both my DO and Master of Public Health degrees from Nova Southeastern University College of Osteopathic Medicine in Davie, Florida. I spent an additional year in medical school completing an undergraduate teaching, research, and clinical fellowship in osteopathic principles and practice. I completed a traditional osteopathic rotating internship with a track in pediatrics at Palms West Hospital before completing residencies in preventive medicine at the Palm Beach County Health Department and family medicine at Broward Health. I hold cert board certifications from the American Board of Family Medicine, the American Osteopathic Board of Family Practice, and the American Osteopathic Board of Occupational and Preventive Medicine. I earned a Master of Business Administration in Healthcare Administration from Florida Atlantic University. Prior to joining the College of Medicine, I was the medical director for the Palm Beach County Health Department's Communicable Disease Clinic as well as the program director for its preventive medicine residency program. At FAU, I divide my time between being the director of the community and preventive medicine clerkship, as well as associate dean for faculty affairs. I look forward to offering integrative clinical consults, preventive medicine consults, as well as osteopathic manipulative therapy in our new practice. All of this blends my interest in primary care prevention and osteopathic manipulation. Thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this lecture today, Dr. Borgia. Thank you, Dr. Groves. All right, without further delay, uh, we present to you Integrative Medicine, a new paradigm in patient care. 
So prior to starting, I just want to highlight that neither Dr. Groves or nor myself have any financial interest or arrangements which could be see, seen as a as a real or apparent conflict of interest in, in the subject of this presentation, except maybe the fact that we both really appreciate innovative health and, and the things that we can offer to our patients. So the course objectives for this presentation today are as listed. Uh, first of all, I want to differentiate alternative, complementary, and integrated medicine. This is a common confusion among patients and, and clinicians, so it's important to start there. We'll then identify the defining principles of integrated medicine and how it functions as a role uh, as a medical specialty. Um, we'll also recognize how integrated medicine is similar but distinct to conventional primary care. We're going to highlight the medical indications for seeking an integrated medicine consult or referral, and we'll discuss the evidence-based treatments used at the Marcus Institute of Integrated Health here at FAU Medicine. We'll outline the evidence supporting acupuncture and osteopathic manipulation. And lastly, we'll describe how the practice of integrated medicine can improve patient care. But most importantly, what we really hope we really hope you do through this hour-long presentation, if you're eating lunch, if you're just relaxing, is just breathe and smile. There's a lot of stress out there right now. So taking taking the next 60 minutes to just relax is key. And that's fundamentally what integrated medicine is all about. So what's in the name? There is a lot of confusion around these three terms, complementary, alternative, or integrated health. So based on the NIH's National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health definition, what is a non, so a non-mainstream practice that is used together with conventional medicine, conventional medicine is everything that you are learning as students and everything to all the physicians out there, that are most of pretty much what you're practicing. So anything that's used together with conventional medicine is considered complementary, which means the majority of patients use seek out or, or could be considered a complementary approach to healthcare because they go and see, and see a regular doctor, whether it be a, a family physician or a specialist, a cardiologist, and so forth, and then they'll go see a chiropractor or an acupuncturist. A lot of times there may not be discussion about what they're doing at, at, at the other place, but but at least they're seeing both. If a non-mainstream practice is used in place of conventional medicine, it's considered, considered alternative, and this is a very rare practice. I think they've, they've estimated it that maybe 1% of the U.S. population truly practices alternative health care, meaning they completely bypass conventional care. It may be seeing an MD or DO who is a physician but does not use conventional medicine anymore, um, but that is still a rare practice. So integrative health instead so what I've underlined here really emphasizes it. It's a holistic patient focused approach to healthcare and wellness, often including mental, emotional, functional, spiritual, social, and community aspects in treating the whole person. Fundamentally, we look at the whole person. We look at everything that makes up their health. It can also lead to disease, nutrition, um, exercise, stress. All of those factors can bring about either health or can bring about disease. Now, the, the very top of this paragraph highlights that we also bring conventional and complementary approaches together in a coordinated way. What tends to stick out about integrative health are the, the tools that we use, the non-conventional tools. But what we try to do is make sure that they're evidence-based. Now, there are specifically defining principles of integrative medicine that I'd like to highlight. First of all, patients and practitioners are, are partners in the healing process. Now, one of the things I'd like to share with my medical students is this. Fundamentally, anything that we provide our patients, whether it be a pharmaceutical drug, whether it be acupuncture, um, a supplement, anything that we provide to them, while all of us, all of us are, are doing it with the, with the hope that we're gonna make our patients' lives better, anything they take can potentially help them or harm them. Um, ultimately, what a side effect is, is, is something that these medications can regularly uh, um, do to patients. And so, it's important to be a partner in this because the patient ultimately has to deal with the consequences of the treatment that we provide. So all factors that influence health, wellness, and disease are taken into consideration. Socioeconomic factors are essential in, in health and disease. Nutrition is essential in health and disease. Exercise and stress level is essential. I recently read a report uh, or saw a report that, the, that mental health issues are going to skyrocket just as a result of COVID-19. And so, Everything that, it, that, that can interact with our lives can 
produce either health or sickness. And so we need to take those into consideration um, with our patients. We use both conventional and, and alternative or complementary methods to facilitate the body's innate healing response. Because fundamentally, anything that we do, whether it be a, a drug that is symptomatically helping our, or decreasing some symptoms that our patients are experience, experiencing, or a, a needle that we stick into the patient, fundamentally what we're doing is just trying to nudge the patient's innate healing response to get better. Get better. We also look for in effective interventions that are less invasive, and, and this should be used whenever possible. A an easy example to think of today is in the with the opioid epidemic. Someone comes in with acute back with acute back pain. We should now know that starting them on a narcotic is a bad idea, but starting them on acupuncture, which has been shown in the evidence to be very effective for acute back pain, is a good idea because it has a low risk has low risk of side effects and fundamentally is less invasive in the long. Long in the long run. We don't reject conventional medicine, nor do we accept alternative therapies uncritically. We really do believe that good medicine should be based on good science. We, of course, emphasize the broader concept of health promotion and the prevention of illness. And as practitioners, we really do try to practice the principles um, of self exploration and self development. As Hippocrates said, physician first heal thyself. And integrated medicine really tries to promote that concept. So Andrew Weil, MD, many consider him the other integrative medicine simply because for many of us who practice integrative medicine, he was one of the first inspirations towards this type of medicine. He is currently the director of the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine. He is a best-selling author. And so before becoming, a, 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 as a medical student, even before medical, medical before even medical school, I read a lot of his books and many doctors who practice integrative medicine really got their first taste of it through his books. He also developed the first academic curriculum in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona. And so many physicians today who practice integrative medicine also trained in him. Integrative medicine is not fringe medicine. In fact, as, as this short list highlights, um, there are over 70 academic medical centers and affiliate institutions that are part of the academic consortium for integrative medicine and health, with the simple mission of advancing the principles and practices of integrated healthcare within academic institutions. At FAU, we hope to join the consortium sometime in the near future. But it just highlights that even in some of the most well known medical schools and, and medical or academic centers around the country, integrative medicine has been ingrained into the systems. And in terms of board certification for integrative medicine, currently it is an optional certification. You can practice integrative medicine as long as you're a board certified physician. But for those who want um, board certification, the American Board of Integrative Medicine is the first uh, board certification available. It is through the National Board of Physician Specialties. To be eligible, you ultimately just have to be a physician with a board certification um, in, in really any specialty. And then secondarily, you have to go through either a fellowship in integrative medicine, which is anywhere from one to two years, or you have to have completed training in one of these three fields, naturopathic medicine, Chinese medicine, which is how I qualify, and chiropractic medicine. And then lastly, you have to successfully pass the board again. So let's differentiate primary care versus integrative medicine, because I think this is another area that a lot of uh, patients and clinicians tend to be uncertain or, or a little confused about. Now, there can be overlap among the two, and there frequently is. So as a family physician, the American Academy of the AAFP is the American Academy, American Academy of Family Physicians. They have a definition of what primary care is, and I consider this the ideal definition. So what they highlight, what I've, what I, what I've underlined, under, or what, what is underlined in blue is, they specifically state that Primary care should be provided by physicians specifically trained for and skilled in comprehensive first contact and continuing care for persons with any diagnosed sign, symptom, or health concern. And the bullet points on the top, the green bullet points on the top right, um, co correspond with the underlying green section. So, what primary care should include is health promotion, disease prevention, health maintenance, counseling, patient education, and diagnosis and treatment of acute and chronic illness. The last underlying statement there, primary care promotes effective communication with patients, 
the role of the patient as a partner in healthcare. And, and I call this the ideal because unfortunately, the reality of primary care can be very different. Now, there are many different types of primary care practices, and I'm making a generalization because most patients are going to go to a primary care practice that is not a, not a, a, a concierge practice, it's not a direct primary care practice, it's a traditional insurance um, billing practice. And what you tend to see, and this is from experience as well as what uh, I would I imagine most of my colleagues who practice primary care have experienced, is a, there tends to be a high volume of patients with chronic complex conditions, as well as acute diseases. There's also, we, we tend to use um, pharmaceutical medications uh, as, as the primary treatment form. We also incorporate annual physicals, vaccinations, and preventive screenings. And some of the procedures that we can offer include things like the G's labs, palpation treatments, and diagnostic procedures. A lot of our practice in primary care are referral, referrals to subspecialists, unless you live in a area where there are not a lot of subspecialists. So my practice, in Tennessee, um, a lot of the things that subspecialists would have provided as a family physician, we did instead, including stress tests and so forth. Paperwork is a lot large part of what primary care does. So what I'm highlighting in this sort of the realistic picture of primary care is that within this medical economic model, what tends to, what what is ultimately pushed is that more patient visits daily increase increases the reimbursement for the clinic. So unfortunately, we tend to have less time with patients in the traditional primary care practice, anywhere from 20 to 40 minute new patient appointments, and anywhere from 10 to 20 um, minute follow up appointments. So you're you're commonly seeing 20 to 30 patients a day. Why this is important is because those ideal components that I talked about, health promotion, disease prevention, counseling, education, tends to get pushed to the side unless you have a larger team that can handle some of those other components. So a lot of times it's just managing the key chronic diseases of, of the primary care, of the patients in the primary care practice. So what is the ideal in integrative medicine? And what I am highlighting here is the Wheel of Health that was put together, put together by Duke's Integrative Medicine Program. I like it because it's one of the, it's just one of the, um, I think, visually complete pictures that I've seen of, as a Wheel of Health. So in an ideal integrative med med medical practice, the patient, which is you in the center, their life is ultimately influenced by all of those factors, those seven factors around them, mind-body connections, movement and exercise, nutrition, environment, relationships, spirituality, et cetera, where medicine, both conventional and complementary and integrative fit in is really in the periphery. We, can, we try to influence those factors. And as I try to highlight, what frequently happens in conventional primary care is we're not really able to enter those realms much. What we try to focus with integrated medicine is really try to delve into all of those parts of, of, of a patient's life to make a long-term impact. So what you see in an integrated medicine model day-to-day -day is as follows. We also see a lot of chronic diseases and difficult to treat conditions. Most of these patients have already tried conventional medicine um, and, and have not been successful in finding things that help. We also see a lot of acute and chronic pain that are also not improved with conventional treatments. We spend a lot more time with our patients talking about nutrition and dietary guidances or in dietary and, and spending time guiding them on dietary practices. We also emphasize lifestyle as well as exercise. We do a lot of mind-body practices. Not everyone practices it, of, of course, but most of us have some training in mind-body and so we can take our patients to meditation or breathing exercises. We absolutely emphasize disease prevention and health promotion. We want to be proactive and not reactive with, with disease. Um, we also can have behavioral health counseling. A lot of our, our, our visits can spend time talking about behavioral health issues. And then we utilize the treatments that I've mentioned previously that are non-conventional, things like acupuncture, osteopathic manipulation, mechanical supplements, IV micronutrients, homeopathics, et cetera. And each practice can vary quite significantly. Um, we, as physicians, of course, can use pharmaceutical drugs when needed. The key to our practice, we try to have a partnership with our patient. And, and a big part of this is, is that we tend to spend a lot longer with our patients. So for new patients, we can spend 60 to 90 minutes with them. And for follow-up patients, we'll spend anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes. This has a whole other conversation in terms of uh, medical financial 
components of, of the longer visit that I'm not going to highlight today, but for the students in the audience, it's something that we will talk about in the future because it's it's, it's an important component to take into consideration with integrative medicine. So why should you go to an integrative medicine specialist or, or for the clinicians and, and students in the, in the audience, which patients should you consider referring to us? So important to look at would be the demographics of integrative medicine in the United States. Um, since 2002, so annually, the National Health Interview Survey conducts a, a, a survey of, of, of all Americans uh, uh, trying to, which is ultimately provides the major source of information for the general health of Americans. And since 2002, every five years, there has been, there has been information and data collected uh, specifically about complementary and integrated health practices. The most recent um, survey was done for integrative and complementary health was done in 2017. So what they have found in these surveys and, and what tends to show consistently is that about a third of all U.S. adults and about 12% of U.S. children use integrative and complementary health approaches. The number, the financial number is about $34 billion spent out of pocket annually on consumers for integrative and, and complementary health therapies. This, this specific number, 34 billion, is a bit old. Uh, the last time the, 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 the number was collected was in 2007. Um, most recently, uh, they're showing that out-of-pocket spending of, of, of everything, including conventional medicine, is closer to about 60 to 70 billion dollars, and we expect that the number spent on integrative health has also increased. There's just no no recent data to tell us exactly about how much. Americans will usually spend their money um, on these types of integrative health practices. Non-vitamin, non-mineral, dietary supplements tends Tend to state uh, tend to take the biggest chunk of, of, of uh, um, or is the biggest area of usage for for adults for U.S. adults, uh, followed by chiropractic, yoga, massage, meditation, and special diets. The specific types of, of conditions that they seek integrative medicine for include most commonly pain conditions. So as you can see by this list, back pain, neck pain, joint pain, and arthritis are the top four. But as you can also see from this list, list some other non-pain conditions are, are frequently sought out or, or integrated medicine is frequently sought out for care, including anxiety, um, heart disease and cholesterol, as well as insomnia. For children, it's very similar. Back or neck pain and other muscular uh, types of pain tend to be the main reasons that the integrated medicine is sought out. Um, but then it's also followed by other things, including Head or chest cold, anxiety and stress, ADHD, and insomnia, which, which I think most people who think of integrated medicine don't think of that of, of those areas as being a common diagnosis to seek out integrated health. But it is a very common reason hey, parents will seek out um, advice from an integrated medicine physician. So in 2017, uh, NHIS specifically did what, what they call the practice specific survey. They looked at three areas of integrative health, including yoga, meditation, and chiropractic, and compared it with previous, previous data. What they found is that the use of yoga among US adults, 18 and over, increased by about 5% from 2012 to 2017. The use of meditation in US adults increased even higher, about 10%, from 4 to 14%. Now, the use of chiropractic did not increase by much, by about 1%. Um, and, and this is the, the average across the country because some, because the use of chiropractic in manual therapies is also very regional. The West Coast tends to, tends to use these types of treatments much more frequently than the East Coast. Um, the Midwest and the South are a little bit higher than the East Coast. So this is an average, about 10% of the, of the U.S adult population who use chiropractic or osteopathic manipulation. What's interesting is that it'll be, what, it'll be very interesting to see the data the next time the NHIS is, is done, simply because what we saw anecdotally after 2017 was, this, was a dramatic rise in the use of integrative therapies, and it's specifically tied to the opioid epidemic, as it became much more of a, of, of a, um, of a regular day-to-day um, um, issue that we were talking about, more patients started seeking integrative health, more, more clinicians started sending patients to integrative health uh, 
practices simply to use, simply for the non-pharmaceutical approaches for pain. And so I believe that this number will, will significantly increase at the next time uh, in, in 2022 when they check this again. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. So another area that I believe most, which what is what is frequently not known about integrative medicine is another type of patient that we tend to get a lot of referrals for are these types of patients. Patients with difficult to treat conditions with negative medical workup and have tried conventional treatments with no success. The story is similar. I will have a patient who will come and see me who's been referred by, by a doctor colleague. And a lot of times the colleague will say, yeah, you know, I don't exactly know what Dr. Borgia does, but the patients I send to him tend to do better, especially the patients who, who, are, who have these chronic um, complex medical conditions who have not improved with conventional treatments. What I like to think, what I like to say, and I, I think a big part of why integrative health can be successful in this is simply that as integrative practitioners, we look at the, the we tend to follow a non-reductionist view of, of health. While in medical school, we tend to train in a reductionist view. We look at the system, we look at the organ, we look at the cell, and we want to find that one thing that is, aha, this is the reason why you're having those symptoms. This is the reason why you're, you're sick. In general, for chronic complex issues, a reductionist approach does not work. So what we like to say in integrative medicine is we look at the whole course, not just the tree. So when we spend time with our patient, um, when we can dive into a lot more of the components that make up their overall health, we can ask them about that. We can ask them about stress and talk about socioeconomics. And a lot of times we'll start finding a clear picture. It's not that one piece of the puzzle that fits everything. It's all of these pieces that eventually just have to be put together. And that is, what I think one of the strongest components of integrative health can, can provide to our patients is this non-reductionist approach to health. So what are we going to offer here at the Marcus Institute of Integrative Health at FMU? First of all, this is, we are gonna be the second, we are officially the second Marcus Institute of Integrative Health. Um, the first one is at Jefferson Health in Philadelphia, as I mentioned earlier. And so, the three main areas of focus that, that our practice, that integrative, that the Marcus Institute at FAU will focus on are going to be these areas, clinical care, education, and research. Now, while this presentation is not going to focus on the education and research, and instead will focus on the clinical care, I do want to highlight some of the things that we are currently uh, uh, doing for these areas. So as, as far as education, this seminar series that you are currently watching is part of the Marcus Institute's um, um, long-term goals to help educate the, the, the public and, and the medical school and the medical students about innovative health. Um, we will also be incorporating some levels of, of, of curriculum about around integrative health into the College of Medicine, um, into the curriculum. We will also, for the community, be offering health fairs and we'll be really trying to find a core group of medical student ambassadors who have an interest and, and hopefully a passion about integrative health to help get the word get, and, and help educate um, patients in the community about what we can offer with integrative health. As far as research, we, our goal is to expand integrative health focused research at FAU and, and or, or in collaboration with the Marcus Institute at Jefferson and eventually with other collaborators around the country. As far as clinical care, these four areas are where we will be focused on here in Boca Raton. We will be offering community integrative medicine care. And so what this specifically means is that we'll, we'll be offering consultations and non-pharmaceutical treatments for all patients, really from cradle to grave, from, from children to, to older adults. A, a problem in this country also is access to medical care. and, and, and particular integrative medicine, which is traditionally a type of medicine that is for all people, no matter the, no matter the uh, you know, socioeconomic status. So an area that we want to also focus on is integrative medicine for underserved communities, working with some of our community partners to try to offer the offer whatever treatments, whatever, whatever um, um, education we can on improving overall health with, through the use of integrative medicine and integrative health care. Given my background also in integrative oncology, we'll be focusing, of course, on, on consultations and treatments for patients diagnosed with cancer. 
So as I highlighted earlier uh, from the NHIS, we find that about a third of all US adults use integrative medicine or some form of integrative health. We find that once diagnosed with cancer, that number jumps higher and from anywhere from 50 to 70% of, of adults diagnosed with cancer will use some form of integrative medicine. So having a, uh, a physician or a clinician who specializes in this and can help guide them to the appropriate treatments is, is key. And this is an area that we will focus on. We're also gonna continue the wellness hub, which, are, which includes classes, events um, around integrative health, mindfulness, self-care and fitness for the patients and community. Uh, this has been ongoing for the past year, but we're and we're going to continue to take it, continue to use the wellness hub, but expand it really for the use with our patients as well as the community. And then in the future, as we are currently in the process of building up our institute, we will include a learning kitchen, and, and the goal of the learning kitchen is to offer culinary medicine for the students, a way for them to a way for students to really dive into nutrition as a, as a key part of, of health and, and medicine and offer community nutrition classes for our patients and, and for anyone who's interested in really trying to improve what they how they what they what they cook ultimately there's an old saying in chinese medicine that the real doctor is the chef at home or the cook at home because disease and disease or health really starts with the food that is being offered at home so we want to be able to really teach our patients in the community how to, do, how to take that tool and, 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 up and bring about healing. The specific clinical services that we will offer at the clinic also include the following. Um, Dr. Drogos and myself will be doing integrative medicine, con integrative medicine consultations. Uh, during the COVID-19, during this time of social distancing, we will be using virtual health visits. Uh, as, a, as an option, and very likely we'll continue those virtual, virtual health visits in the future. Integrative oncology, as I mentioned. Uh, I will be offering acupuncture and Chinese medicine, and we hope to bring in some more practitioners of, of, of both in the future. We'll be offering this both as for individual patients as well as community acupuncture for patients who might not be able to afford or don't have insurance coverage of, of acupuncture. Uh, as both DOs, we will also be offering osteopathic integrative medicine or OMT. We will discuss nutrition and dietary guidance, focusing on mind-body therapies, um, discussing healthy lifestyle, lifestyle counseling, and of course, using many different tools for non-pharmaceutical pain management, including body mechanics and therapeutic activities. We will also eventually offer botanical, natural, and dietary supplements. And in the future, once the clinic is, is completely built up, we hope to offer IV micronutrient therapy, medical massage, functional medicine, and more. We are sharing, currently sharing the FAU faculty practice here uh, at the uh, Galen Medical Building on the fourth floor. Our practice that is being built out is half of that fourth floor. Half of it is currently the primary care practice, and so we're taking a small section of that um, to use, in which, it, which this room is, is a part of where I'm at now. Um, and in the future, we it'll be easy for patients to be able to both utilize the primary care practice, which will also have other specialties in the future, and then come over to the Innovative Institute and take advantage of all of the things that we have to offer. This is our team for now, Dr. Drogas and myself, who are here today, and Ashley Phillips, who is our Innovative Health Coordinator. Ashley and I were actually, actually worked together at Ohio State University, so she has a long history and experience with Innovative Health, so we hope to really be able to grow this practice into the future. So, that was the overview of what we're offering. What we're gonna do now is specifically look at the two big treatments that we that that, that are going to be offered by Dr. Drogas and myself, the osteopathic manipulation, and acupuncture. And so at this point, I'm gonna turn the, the uh, screen over to Dr. Drogas. Okay, um, I think you need to go to the next slide. I'm gonna share with you a little bit about osteopathic medicine and how our treatments work. So osteopathic medicine had its roots during the 1800s. Our founder was actually an MD, Andrew Taylor Still, who uh, practiced in Missouri around the 1800s. And he's considered the father of osteopathy. He um, had the experience of losing one of his children to pneumonia and was a physician during the Civil War where he saw more people die from disease. And the treatments that were available at the time, things like bloodletting and, and heavy metals and toxins, he questioned whether they were actually helpful or more harmful. 
for patients. And so he was looking for a different way to be able to offer therapy. And he started to uh, use osteopathic manipulation and ultimately built a philosophy around what he was doing. So on the next slide, I'll show you the, um, the tenants, the tenants of osteopathic medicine, what we base our practice on. And if you think about the fact that this was developed in the 1800s, how um, forward thinking uh, Dr. Dr. A.T. still was, uh, in terms of thinking about the body and its innate tendency toward health and that our role as physicians was really to sort of minimize the restrictions that were limiting health. And he did this through manipulating the musculoskeletal system and um, avoided a lot of the, the treatments at, at the time. So these are our tenets. And I look at them and I think, wow, these are really in line with integrative medicine. And just what we are teaching our medical students today at FAU in terms of developing holistic physicians who understand the relationship between mind, body, and spirit, and um, a focus on wellness as opposed to, to disease and looking at the whole patient. And I like to think uh, that that's what we are teaching our physicians and osteopathic medicine has been promoting that for uh, since the beginning. And on the next slide, um, just to show you a little bit about osteopathic mani manipulative treatment or, or therapy. So this, these are actually hands-on techniques where um, physicians will diagnose and treat uh, what we call somatic dysfunction or restriction in the musculoskeletal system. And this is our way of both treating and preventing illness or injury. And we'll use a patient's own muscles, um, joints, and we use a variety of techniques that use things like stretching, uh, gentle pressure, and resistance. And so we learn how to do OMT in medical school. In addition to the traditional uh, curriculum that all MDs learn, we have additional training in OMT. So we have it available uh, as an option uh, therapeutically for our patients. And it's uh, something that we like to think complements all of the additional medical training that we have in all of the uh, other train uh, other therapeutic modalities, including surgery and, and uh, pharmaceutical products that we can offer to our patients. And on the next slide, I, I think Dr. Borges has already um, covered why um, patients seek integrative consults. I think the, the reasons that patients seek osteopathic manipulative therapy are really similar. And we tend to treat uh, conditions where we can, we can alleviate restriction in the musculoskeletal system and improve a patient's symptoms. So a lot of things related to um, pain or uh, arthritis, but also um, you know TMJ, things like asthma and sinus congestion, just alleviating restrictions uh, can help with those kinds of diseases as well. So you know a lot of the things that you'll send your patients to the integrative practice for will make the decision that osteopathic man manipulative therapy would be an appropriate part of their treatment plan. And on the next slide, um, just some examples of some of the techniques um, that we'd like to use when we're doing our therapy. So our goal is, uh, is always to uh, treat somatic dysfunction. So the, the restrictions in the musculoskeletal system that we'll identify. And these are some of the um, therapies that we like to use. Um, the high velocity, low amplitude, or HVLA is probably similar to what a lot of people think about with chiropractors, you know, the kind of cracking of, of backs and, and necks. Um, but we use a lot of other treatments, including treating the lymphatic system, which um, is getting a lot of attention right now uh, with COVID, but also all the soft tissues um, through treating um, counter strain points, also um, viscer somatic points um, for certain diseases and myofascial release um, still technique. Uh, a lot of these techniques we'll use, you know, both indirectly and directly. We think about what our patients can tolerate, what's gonna make them feel comfortable and, you know, what's indicated in the picture of their sort of overall health when we choose um, a treatment for them. On the next slide, I just wanted to highlight the evidence base for osteopathic manipulation. And it's one of those things where you think about doing a double-blinded placebo-controlled trial of an osteopathic technique. It's a little bit challenging in terms of, you know, inter-rater reliability, having, you know, enough practitioners who can do the same thing. And, you know, how do you really blind someone when they're delivering a therapeutic treatment, you know, if they're, and, and even a patient, you know, just having someone put their, their hands on them and you know not actually delivering the treatment or delivering what we call a, a sham treatment but there's a, a growing base of evidence um, 
for certain uh, protocols in certain types of conditions. The first one um, that I mentioned showed osteopathic manipulation um, as an adjunctive treatment for hospitalized patients with pneumonia. And they used a protocol called MOPSI, which uh, was a variety of techniques and treatments. And they actually showed that they were able to discharge patients with pneumonia from the hospital earlier. Of course, they still need antibiotics, you know, oxygen, breathing treatments, everything that you would have as your standard therapy for pneumonia, but adding um, OMM shortened the hospital stay. And, um, you know, similarly with pneumonia, um, asthma, there's um, some good evidence around otitis media and having recurrence of otitis media through, um, through cranial treatments. Um, there was a study uh, called the PROMOTE uh, study protocol for addressing pain in pregnancy. And, you know, pregnancy is one of those situations where you may not want to use pharmaceuticals um, for your patient and using, you know, some gentle and safe uh, techniques for, for pregnancy. You can actually um, help your patients with their discomfort and, and make them more comfortable. Um, on the next slide, there's just some additional um, evidence. A lot of it relates to musculoskeletal conditions. Um, if you don't mind going, yeah, on the next slide, you'll just see uh, some things like low back pain. Um, there was a, a nice study uh, that was published in JAMA, just kind of showing that osteopathic manipulation was sort of as good as um, the standard therapy, which included pharmaceuticals, um, but carpal tunnel, uh, we can treat headaches, there's just a growing base of evidence for the treatments that work, uh, why we use them, how we use them. And um, it's important in terms of how we make our decisions about what to offer our patients. And then on the last slide, I just wanted to highlight um, some next steps because I know that uh, many of the folks that are listening to this talk are uh, trained in allopathic medicine or MDs. And what's actually happened is now there's opportunities for MDs to learn osteopathic manipulation in the same way uh, that I was taught it. There's all kinds of courses available, um, series, online modules. Um, I personally find some great YouTube videos um, for particular techniques. Uh, if there's something like if I'm dealing with a patient with shoulder pain, I'll look for, you know, a video of the Spencer techniques on how to treat the shoulder and, you know, YouTube has great uh, training on some of these techniques as well. But um, just to highlight that these courses are available, that this is something that, um, you know, now all physicians can pursue and learn and um, make available to their patients. So with that, we'll, um, this is just an example of a course. Um, if there's live courses in September that uh, will be offered in Ohio, they uh, osteopathic medicine for all through the Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine um, in Ohio. So this and others for folks to you know go and practice hands-on and um, learn these techniques to feel comfortable to be able to offer them to your patients in the future. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Drogos. So, contrary to popular belief, acupuncture was not discovered like this. Um, but what we do know about acupuncture is it has quite a long history. It's over 2,000 years old. At least the written history is over 2,000 years old. The, the uh, start of acupuncture has been attributed to Shen Nong, who is considered the father of Chinese medicine. But what we know from the archaeological evidence is that acupuncture is much older anywhere from four to 8,000 years old. Um, and the earliest, um, the earliest, earliest example of acupuncture tools is this. I can promise anyone who decides to come and see us that we will not use these acupuncture needles um, unless you really want us to. But uh, so there's, there's another long story about how this, how this potentially developed, which I will save for a different presentation in the future. So acupuncture, how did it come to the West? How did it come to Europe? How did it come to the United States? What many don't realize is that acupuncture has been in the West for quite a long time. Once merchants and traders started going to China from Europe, doctors, of course, traveled with these merchants and, and the European doctors wanted to see what the Chinese doctors were doing and brought this, these needles back and, and started using it on patients. By the time the 1800s came around, there was quite a lot of interest in both acupuncture, in both the United States and in Europe on, about, around acupuncture. There are quite a lot of articles that were written in the scientific literature about acupuncture. What's unfortunate, though, is that the interest 
while the interest in Europe continued to grow, the interest in the United States died. So as a comparison, there are today about 30,000 physicians in Germany that practice acupuncture. In the United States, there are only about uh, uh, 3,000 to 5,000 physicians that practice acupuncture. So it changes the, the way that acupuncture is perceived because now it's on the periphery instead of in ingrained in part of uh, uh, ingrained in medicine. What's ironic is that someone who we consider the father of modern medicine, Sir William Osler, um, who was one of the founders of John Hopkins Hospital, in his book, The Principles and Practice of Medicine, he writes that in acute cases, acupuncture is the most efficient treatment for sciatica and lumbago, that it has prompt efficacy in many instances. So how did acupuncture ultimately die? If the person who we consider the father of, of, of modern medicine practiced acupuncture back in 1892, wrote about it, sort of went away, and, and that's a whole other conversation as well. So. We know that acupuncture revived in the United States around the 70s, and, and in large part because James Reston, who was a New York Times reporter, um, accompanied Henry Kissinger to China. He got appendicitis, and he got both the operation to remove the appendix, an appendectomy, as well as acupuncture. He wrote an article about it, and is, this introduced many Americans to acupuncture. But what we actually know also is that acupuncture may not have actually disappeared. It might have transformed, and 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 become sort of an American acupuncture. So today, for the medical students in the audience, you can go to any sports medicine practice, um, physical medicine rehab practice, physical therapy practice, and most of them will have a book by Janet Trebell, Myofascial Release and Trigger Point Manual. She is a Cornell trained physician who is most famous for being John F. Kennedy's uh, personal physician. She practiced and created this technique called Trigger Point. And she stated that the medical way of saying trigger point is acupuncture. Acupuncture professionals practice dry needling as acupuncture therapy. Another physician, Chen Gunn, a Canadian physician, proposed that as a first step towards acceptance of acupuncture by the medical profession, it was suggested that a new system of acupuncture naming be introduced so that the motor points or trigger points be used as a substitute for the term acupuncture or acupoints. So what this is ultimately hinting at is that acupuncture did not truly disappear because you can find trigger point therapy, trigger point treatments in most medical practices. Dry needling is a big part of, uh, is, a, is a part of practice that many physical therapists are trying to incorporate. This is fundamentally just acupuncture. So what is the evidence around the use of acupuncture? Um, because we're running out of time, I'm gonna kind of highlight this a little quickly. Research in acupuncture has grown exponentially in the past 20 years. It, it, there are over 13,000 studies in, in over 60 countries with hundreds of meta-analyses done, result of thousands of human and animal studies. But the literature was summarized first back in 2010 by the Australian Department of, uh, Veteran, of Veteran Affairs, 2014 by the US Department of Veteran Affairs, and lastly in 2017 by the Acupuncture Evidence Project. And what this most recent um, what, what the Acupuncture Evidence Project ultimately highlighted is that there were 122 conditions that were identified. There is strong evidence that supports the effectiveness of about eight of these conditions. There's even a larger 38 conditions that have moderate positive evidence, and there's about 71 conditions where there's weak positive or there's really unclear evidence, meaning that there really hasn't been much research done. And then there are five conditions that only have, that really have no evidence. The last two areas just um, really need to the further research needs to highlight whether or not those 76 conditions have any acupuncture would have any benefit for them. But the specific breakdown of these conditions are, are highlighted here. So the eight conditions that have a strong positive effect, as you can see in this list, is mostly a list of, of pain conditions, but, but the blue arrows are pointing out three things that many people don't think about utilizing acupuncture for maybe nausea and vomiting because it's become much more common to use to use acupuncture for nausea and vomiting but allergic rhinitis is something that has really positive uh, benefit from acupuncture and yet we're not seeing a lot of patients who get referred for, for acupuncture the list of 38 is it has even more areas that are non-pain related um, as an integrative oncologist i have used acupuncture to help with patients with cancer to help patients with cancer pain in particular, breast cancer patients who, who are started on something called an aromatase inhibitor, one of the common side effects is that they just have unbearable muscle aches and pains in arthrologists, and many of them are ready to quit these, these drugs. And these drugs are something that they, they usually have to be on uh, 
um, for the remainder of their life. Acupuncture can help decrease the symptoms and allow them to stay on these drugs and, and, and can really be the difference between them quitting the therapy versus continuing. A little paw print that I've highlighted on, on a couple of things, acute stroke and post-stroke spasticity, just highlights the fact that veterinary acupuncture is a real thing and it's actually quite a big thing. And, and what's ironic is that in terms of, um, sorry, in terms of stroke or, or the, um, the issues with stroke, um, uh, vets tend to use acupuncture much more regularly for animal patients than we use it on human patients in this country. Another continuation of the 38 list of, of moderate positive evidence and uh, the last of the, of the 38. Stroke rehabilitation is something that, again, is really utilized in veterinary medicine. And unfortunately here, we just don't use it as much. A lot of times I'll get patients who are months out from, um, from stroke before I start using acupuncture on them. This is a horse that's getting acupuncture. Why is this important? Why are these last two areas important? Why are we talking about osteopathic manipulation? Why are we talking about acupuncture as we close here and provide some time for questions? It's because that adding another tool to your medical bag for the students out there can be the difference, can really be, it can provide a, 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 a huge benefit for society as a whole. This study that came out last year showed that family physicians trained in acupuncture prescribed fewer strong opioids. And those who had advanced acupuncture training prescribed far fewer opioids overall. And, and, and what that does is it ultimately helps decrease the likelihood that a patient is going to start on an opioid medicine and, and helps decrease the, the issue with the opioid epidemic. So while I was at Ohio State University, many, many students reached out to me about getting trained in ear acupuncture or, or, or starting to incorporate some, um, some innovative treatments in, in their practice. And so I'm throwing this to the students in the audience. Um, it's easy enough to set up something to get trained in ear acupuncture. And what we did at OSU is we used that training and brought it to the Columbus Free Clinic so that the students started creating a, a, an ear acupuncture clinic, which became very popular. We did it once a month and it quickly moved to twice a month. We were on the verge of doing it three times a month before I moved down to Boca Raton. So, final thoughts. Innovative medicine is a paradigm which enhances current medical practice and improves patient care by allowing for patient clinical partnership. Longer visit time makes non-conventional evidence-based treatments accessible and focuses on improving the whole person with good medicine, nutrition, lifestyle, and mind-body practices. OMT and acupuncture are effective evidence-based treatments for pain and other medical conditions and should be considered an option for referral and consultation. And for those medical students and physicians out there, those who learn integrative medicine can offer a valuable set of tools which can improve the lives of our patients. This is a list of our references for those who want it. We can send it to you later. And I'd like to open up the floor now for questions. Thank you very much for, for taking the time to listen to our presentation. Any questions out there? Let's see in the chat. So for those of you who who uh, uh, who heard it, who came a little later, the only way to ask questions would be to enter it in the chat function. So if you have any questions at all, please, please um, enter it in the chat. We'll spend some time. And if 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 you don't have a question now, if you have a question later, you can always uh, shoot me an email. Um, for the students in it and and those in the audience, um, this little QR code can help you uh, can help us. Um, will provide an a, uh, evaluation for us so we could. Uh, so the first question from Christine Adams to all panelists. Um, traditionally speaking, not much research funding has been allocated for complementary medicine. Is that expanding greatly? In fact, it has. Um, not complementary medicine, uh, per se, more so integrative health, uh, as, as I try to highlight. Um, when the National Institute of Health um, first created the National Center for Alternative Medicine back in the um, in the 90s, which has now been trans has, has been uh, modified to the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. There, there was funding that was included in that, and um, there's quite a lot of areas of funding, in particular looking for non-pharmaceutical options for for pain, and, and, and um, you know, so a lot of the, the current funding is around the opioid epidemic. So 
the good thing in, in my career, I've seen an increase in, um, in funding for research, in it, but there's always need for more. I hope that answers that your question, Christine. Other questions? Five minutes. Anyone who has other questions? Well, if not, please feel free to email me here. Um, I'll, I'll leave this uh, up a little bit for anyone to. Uh, my email is nborgia at health.fau.edu. Thank you very much for taking the time uh, for joining us today. Um, have, a, have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. We'll see you at the next seminar sometime in the fall.